morning, of course, we're going to be talking about uh, the spiritual development of children. Lean on this again. Now, we have many experts in that here. Anybody who has come to this talk already probably has children or is thinking of it. And looking through the audience, I know there are many people who have already <coughs> So there, I'm not the expert. I'm not the only expert here. None of us we call ourselves an expert. We've all learned by trial and error. So there's a lot of wisdom in the room, and I hope to tap into it a little bit later. One of the things I do want you to do as we go along, if a question occurs to you, write it down. Uh, we may not get to it this morning, but later I hope to compile both your reactions, your suggestions, your questions, and all the rest integrate them into what will then be a more final product. And later, if you give me your email, you'll get the final product. It might be two months from now, but you'll get it. Uh, and I mean it seriously. There's a lot of wisdom here in the room. It's a great tech I'm going to start off um, by just giving you a little overview of what's happening in America today. Because what we're about, I think this is a very exciting time to be living. It's an awful time, because we can see the crisis going on. But the exciting thing is actually the crisis got deep enough now that people are getting concerned and ready to roll up their sleeves and do it. Washington is now every summer getting more and more young adults coming in who are coming with a purpose. They've studied in college, they're coming to Washington to make a difference there. And the same thing is happening in institutions all around. The kids going into the priesthood, kids going into the priesthood. <laughs> <laughs> and into the media and all the rest. There's a whole rebirth happening. Even as the decay continues, the new shoots are growing. And critical to all of this, of course, are the parents who are going to form the children who are going to continue that work and be the great leaders of the next century. Uh, they're probably in the womb of some of you right now. Or you, they're at home and whatever age. So it's a great time. Let me go over and just give you a quick overview of the crisis we're in. This here is um, the United States at present. That goes almost to the year 2000 from 1950 to the year 2000. In 1950, for every 100 children born, that year, 12 kids entered a broken family. Four born out of wedlock, eight, which is the yellow, uh, where the, their parents divorced that year. And you can see the way they both rose. At present, we can just round out the numbers saying that for every 100 kids born in the year 2000, that year, 60 kids <coughs> entered a broken family. The parents rejecting each other. We have the Pope calls it the culture of death. I, I lucky enough from a different angle, same thing, but I call it the culture of rejection. The rejection between the parents and then the mothers rejecting their child. The black there is the abortion. For every 100 kids born that year of those conceived, how many were aborted. Good news is that's been dropping, at least on the surgical abortions. We've got the new form of abortion of which we have no data at all, which is the drug-induced abortions. England, this is, um, to give you an idea, just uh, this is, these are snapshots of the country. These are good surveys which give a fairly good picture of what's happening in the country. Number of kids who run away from home in the UK. The bottom you have two parent families, and there are three types of two parent families. You've got the intact married, you've got the step family, and you've got the cohabiting. So actually you've got four types because you've got the cohabiting natural, real man and dad with their kids, and then the cohabiting, which is like the the mother with the boyfriend and, and probably her kids. Maybe his that one. Lowest two parent family, next is a single parent family, and the hardest of all most difficult the step parent family. Mm -hmm. uh, the same, by the way, it goes much that same ratio for serious crime. Kids who end up, not in numbers, but in the proportions out of families. The step family is a very difficult thing to pull off. Rates of pregnancy for kids, this is American data, uh, 19, it's about eight years ago. Good snapshot. This is of rates of pregnancy for teenagers, girls, who have a good relationship with at least, at least one parent by frequency of worship. Those who worship weekly or more, a few times a month, a few times a year, or well, less than monthly, and never. So you can see there's slight impact of <coughs> when does abortion occur? 
less than 15, the big one is 15 to 19 years. Next, 20 to 24, 25 to 29, 30 to 34, and down to about 34. Abortion is essentially a phenomenon of the young under 20, and particularly uh, under 25, combined both. <coughs> Snapshot of America. Intact family, step family, cohabiting, divorced, and single. How do kids rate father? Is he warm and loving? And of the proportion of those who say strongly rate their father as warm and loving, intact, which is plenty of room for improvement here. Intact is by no means perfect. Forty-one percent, twenty-five, fourteen, six percent, three point three. Now this has a big impact on the next one. I think there's a. This is looking at teens who feel close to dad. Their rates of virginity in their teenage years. Not close at all. Now, the, by the way, the yellow is those who are still virgins, and the blue are those who have already had sexual intercourse. Not at all, very little, somewhat close, quite a bit close, but very close. The closer the kid is to the part, the stronger the probability of virginity. Fathers, particularly here, have a, have a huge, huge role. Starting very early, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, we had this one before. Teen virginity and parental worship. But that is essentially the blue line there is the virginity, and as the parental worship goes up, this is neither mother nor father worship. The second one is mother worships, dad doesn't. Third one, which is slightly higher, dad worships, mother doesn't. And the last one is when they both worship. Teenage virginity by family structure. <coughs> and by the way, you'll be glad to know kids who have the highest rate of virginity. Not kids from intact marine families, well they are, but they're adopted kids, adopted early from intact marine families. Yeah. Then the intact marine, and then that's so one. There's all sorts of reasons for that, and we can get into that with you later. And that's by intact uh, widowed, cohabiting, divorced, step single, living with the grandparents, and then the poor kids, in the worst case of all, are the flip side of these kids at the very top foster, foster kids. Teen virginity, peers in worship. Probability that a 16-year-old is going to be sexually active, depending on the teens, they're with their, who their friends are, and how frequently the friends worship. If the friends are all sexually active and none of them worship, what's the probability that the 16-year-old will be sexually active? 96%. Different combinations as you move away from that down to the other end, all the, all the teens' friends worship every Sunday or every weekend, and none of them are sexually active. What's the chance that that teenager will be sexually active? Three percent. Common sense. For instance, this is a great, it's a great chart, actually, I think, but also it, it illustrates the social sciences prove the obvious by means that are not obscure and very expensive. <laughs> all the grandparents here have absolutely no doubt about saying, of course, well, that's it. <laughs> in 82, this is a, so modern times, uh, we haven't had a replication of this, what we're looking at here are young women uh, 23 to 24 years old, snapshot of America at the time, it's a national sample, their levels of virginity depending on their level of worship, and the blue here are the virgins, and over there at the very end. This here is they don't go at all, don't worship at all. Over at the other end, gradually moving up. More than once a week, three quarters, still virgins. This is not teenagers. This is the sex in the city age group. Huh? Now, for the men, they're not as good, <laughs> but it's the same direction. Over 50% of American men who worship weekly or more still virgins in their mid-twenties. So ladies, or let your friends know where you're going. Now this is very important. I don't think I have the chart here. But it's coming out more and more important. The stability of marriage is phenomenally related to monogamy. Only one sexual partner in a lifetime. That you do not experience the sexual act with anyone else is a tremendous help 
to stability. It's a tremendous help to actually to good sexual relations. Guess who has the best, I said this one here before, right in this room. Guess who has the best sexual enjoyment? Well, at the end actually, it's, it's women who worship weekly or more and are monogamous. This is from the biggest survey we've ever had on this one. And then you got Eva Junk and Catholic women are buying in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> Evangelical women were for the greatest ecstasy, let's call it, in the sexual act, huh? slightly above the Catholic women. But then the Catholic women go slightly above the Evangelical women for the frequency with which it is. <laughs> and the punchline of this is, you guys, Justin, you're not married yet. No. 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 Find an evangelical girl who's become a Catholic. <laughs> the impact of worship on teenage boys right through their very time of puberty. This here is over seven periods ranging from about age 13 through to about age 15 where the testosterone level of the boy is measured each period. And also tracking the frequency of worship. Now you've got two groups here. You've got low testosterone boys and high testosterone. The guys who've got high testosterone have a much harder attack with purity. It makes sense, you know. It's flinging all through them at a much heavier rate than the boy who doesn't have it. Now, the high testosterone is both the the yellow and the light blue. Okay? And the low testosterone is that dark blue and the purplish color. Now, the difference between those two groups where the arrows are pointing out, uh, one is between the two highs and the other is between the two lows, is the difference that weekly worship makes on whether they become sexually active or not. Now, one thing I want to draw to your attention, there's not a huge difference actually between the sexual activity of the low testosterone boy and the high testosterone boy who does some worship. That's that dark blue and the yellow. The low testosterone boy has a much easier time if he worships. You can see that's the lowest line. That's that. And the kid who has got much the same level of testosterone doesn't worship at all. In other words, has no guidance probably. This is, again, a snapshot. He's sexually active, which is the same as the, the other kid. Worship, and this is just measuring worship alone, has a huge impact on the, on the boy. This is a picture of America over the last uh, 40 years, from 1950 up to the present. That purple dots at the top is the average median in constant dollars, the income of the American family with children. And it's, it wavered there through a lot. <laughs> quite well actually through the 50s and mid-60s and from there on till about the mid-90s in essence there wasn't much difference in the, in the value of the take-home pay. It's been going up the last uh, seven or eight years now. The blue line is that rejection ratio. Remember the first chart I started off with for every hundred kids born? Now we go against. That essentially is tracking that. The belongingness in America has been going down as essentially our essentially material wealth has been going down. <coughs> Quick, now uh, this here is a snapshot of American kids, very recent big national sample, the impact of worship. And this is just worship impact. And I'm talking about the details of virtuous family life, although there may be some correspondence, there probably is. This is running away by church attendance weekly. A couple of times a month, less than a couple of times a year, to never. And you can see the way that goes up. This here is a phenomenal one. Grade point average, math and English combined, by level of worship. Highest the kid who worships weekly, and goes down to the lowest is never. There's a couple of combinations of it. Forget about the blue and yellow here. These are essentially statistical uh, levels of statistical difference. Mild anxiety, lowest in the kid who worships weekly, highest in the kid who never does. Times they get drunk, 
lowest. Now, this is American kids right now. Again, worship, of course, doesn't make for perfection either. <coughs> None of us would ever expect that it does. But you can see its impact. Ever using car drugs? <coughs> suicide ideation. Ever think of suicide? Not that they're contemplating. Running away by church attendance? Number of sex partners for girls by church attendance. Again, not perfect by just going to church, but it still has its impact. Ever pregnant by church attendance. Clearly related to the one before. This here is a, actually, we'll probably just leave it at this. I can go on with a few more. This is the combination of the intact family that worships a lot, weekly or more, a couple, at least a couple of times a month. That's that tall one. And at the back, the low one, the burgundy ones are the families with a history of rejection. Single parent, divorced parent, step family, the cohabiting one that's split. And the two blue ones are the family that's always belonged together, mom and dad. So in other words, the intact married or the cohabiting that have never split. And believe it or not, there are cohabiting families who have kids who are in their teens, who never split, and who go to church weekly. Yes, they're a very small portion, but they're there, <laughs> and they're included here. And they have much the same benefits, actually. Not all, but much the same. That there just shows you the great point average by church attendance and family structure. Huge difference. Um, okay, let me, that's enough of this sort of stuff. Uh, what I'm going to go to next. Justin, could you tell me how I can turn off that screen part, because I'm going to be using my notes here. By way of introduction, it's that sort of stuff that I do for my living all the time. This is like the insight data with Congress through the through the data, or insight therapy with Congress through the data and with the media. We're actually actually having that effect. This sort of argument uh, did help the whole switch to public policy saying we should restore marriage. The debate is now over among social scientists. The intact marriage family is the best place for this to be raised. Um, not all the media is totally there with us yet, but they're getting there. Now, what I want you to think of as we go through the rest, which is really going to be about how do we lead our kids, not into worship, that's hard, but we want to go deeper. Uh, how do we lead them into living the supernatural life? What's going to be very handy for all of us later, actually, are the stories where this has really worked well. And if you have stories, I'd love to capture them and then send them out to everybody. I'll give my email at the end. But any of you who have good stories, please send them on to me. I'm also looking for lists of books that are good, or even sections of books. There are books that often have great sections of them, not parts of this, even though the whole book may not be something you say, well, there's you know, three quarters of it you can skip, but this quarter is great, or this chapter, or this page. If you flag me to any of those you know, then I'd send it back out to everybody. We get the collective wisdom and give it back to everybody, but I'll become much richer as a result. Um, good movies, you get into the whole thing of imagination. So lists of movies, lists of books that are good for the imagination of the kids that have inspired. Um, please send those on. Okay. Starting right now into the issue of, let's say you have got the newborn kid. Young couple, got the young couples here, first child coming. How would you, if I was starting over again, what would I do? For what I've learned, uh, talking to others. Introducing them into the supernatural life, I think kids are primed for it if we lead them the, the right way. And the simplest and, I think, the easiest way is Christmas, the crash, baby Jesus, and that whole story. All kids, we all love it, and kids absolutely love it. And through the, at least by the second year, the first year, the two year, the second year, the third year, the fourth year, and traditions around the crash, 
great little tradition we picked up from somebody was having the empty crash off to the side prior to Christmas and then uh, prompting the kids, make little sacrifices, do little acts of kindness and all the rest for baby Jesus to get ready for his coming by doing something kind for your brother or your sister. And every time you do something like that, don't let anybody else see it. But when you do it, you've got permission to take a straw out of this here and put it in the fresh, in the empty fresh. So what you're really doing is getting the crib ready and nice and comfortable for baby Jesus when he comes, that it can lie in all this kindness and goodness and sacrifice and all the rest. Little things like that. I'm sure families have had other little things like that. Send those in and send all the <coughs> But that's a great way. The baby Jesus himself, the story of Christmas, the getting ready, the crash out there, the, the different stages, the wise men coming. Some families put the wise men way over in the corner here, and the crash is down there, and gradually they're gradually coming. <laughs> Christmas Day is there, they're still out there. You know. <laughs> and the kids' imagination can go right with that, and it opens up all sorts of stuff. I think Christmas is a great way of introducing the child most naturally into being with our Lord in the way that they just love him. Then from there, when they're a bit older, they can see you when they're younger, but not too much older, four. You can really introduce them to Lent and Calvary, getting ready for Calvary. Okay, we've got Christmas, but then we have Lent, and we've got Calvary, and our Lord's dying, and all the rest. And again, the same thing. The sacrifices through Lent, and depending on your way of doing it, your demands, and I would demand, and I'd urge them. A book that had a huge effect on Teresa was I was a psychologist, and somewhat probably influenced a little bit too much, despite all the good formation I got uh, by psychology, and inclined to make things a little too easy for the kid, you know, take care of their self-concept and all that sort of stuff. And then I read the book, Eden Stein's autobiography, first one. And this Jewish family in Eastern Germany or Poland, wherever they're called, it was just phenomenal. I recommend it to you. And you just look at Jewish families. And they, their kids often turn out great, hardworking, rise to the top, and you know, new shaping America. Coming out of this tremendous family tradition of demanding of kids. And kids can take it. We're just, we're, we're too soft in our kids. That's a book I'd recommend to get your ideas of how demanding it can be, and, and still the kids thrive on <coughs> Demanding doesn't mean being harsh. It's totally different. Actually, demanding has to be really good, it has to be loving, but still it's demanding. Now, coming back to Lent, you can really, be, you can begin to suggest to your kids, in the whole area of the interior life, freedom is absolutely key. So you can suggest to your kids, you can't demand Contradiction. It will destroy your kid if you demand penance. It's got to come out of love. It's got to come out of imitation of others or desire to be like that, never, never forcing or pushing. Um, as kids get older, of course, one of the great gifts that Mel Gibson has given us, of course, this will be for the older kids, it's the movie, The Passion, which in a way has laid out for us in great imagery what so many of the saints and great spiritual writers have tried to do in books that would lead us deep into the passion. Now with this great book, I think it's something for the older kids, clearly because of the level of uh, the suffering and violence and all the rest that's in there, it be that you don't want to disturb these too much. But for the teenagers, fine. And for ourselves, at least I've made the resolution to watch that quite often. And I wish when I'm in temptation, I could just quit it right off. <laughs> so the more you burn it into your... Then, then, Bible stories when the kids are young, and there are lots of different editions of different Bible stories. Great time. I'm going back now to the three, four, five, six year old. Reading to kids. By the way, this is one way where fathers can get so close to the kids in the way the kids will always love it. Mothers have a zillion ways of getting close to the kids. For fathers, it's play, is the big way, and reading. And uh, time spent reading. I know one man uh, who later on got into real difficulties and caused real grief to his family, but was extraordinarily close to his kids by reading to them all the time, right through their teen years. And they loved it, and I think actually, even though it caused the family tremendous suffering later on, 
somehow or another, a lot of what he had given helped him get through the suffering that he later caused uh, by the reading. Reading is a great way for fathers to be close to the kids. Now, the whole issue of saints is something that uh, uh, books on saints is a tricky one. Um, I'm going to recommend a book. It's a little expensive at present because it's, it's printed by Kinko's. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of the best books of modern saints. He's not canonized, but people know his name is Kyle McGinnis, who uh, died a couple of years ago. I knew him. And uh, he's a saint. He's a canonized saint. Now, this, this guy was a soccer player. He was a dancer. He was everything. <coughs> he, he was a brilliant kid. But more than that, he lived from early on an intense life of love with our Lord. He just grew. You could see it. He was amazing. He died. Two years ago, the Malna College, one of the most secular colleges in the whole country, out in California. And uh, the kids there still talk about him. And they knew it was his love of work. Every day he went to Mass. And he had no bike, he used to bike every part of it. He, he had his own little foibles and faults which come through. I'm going back on this actually. Books on saints, good ones are hard to get. Because the tradition of saint stories of the past doesn't fit us at all. I don't like them. Kids don't like them, you know. But any stories, they don't have to be canonized. But what we need, just to go back like the early Christians, we need the stories of men and women whom we know love their Lord and live their life accordingly. They don't have to be canonized. Yeah. Few of us have many of us have met a canonized saint in their life, huh? But many of us have met many saints. We prop each other up and they help us by their example along the way. So we need books. Uh, if you have any that you'd recommend, say, look, this is a good read for a kid to be inspired of what living the interior supernatural life is all about. The liturgical year, the liturgical year is a key thing for forming your children's supernatural life, living with God. And actually, for that to happen, you have to be ready. Uh, now the Pope has been, and I think in the last, since Vatican II, we can see the emphasis on this. What the Church is trying to do is to bring us back to living the liturgical year. The Christmas definitely helps. Then Lent, I think we're fairly good at that part. It's the other parts that get, I don't like this, that need more stacking up. Some things that will really help us live the liturgical year is essentially to live the sacramental how many of us, instead of, or on top of, celebrating our birthday, celebrate what is a much more important day, <coughs> Baptism Day. Now, in Spain and some Mediterranean countries, they do that. But that's the day when you really became alive in the living the life of the Blessed Trinity. Do you do it? Are you aware of it? That's a focus. Are you aware of, are you, do your kids know about their baptismal days? That's a day to celebrate. You don't do it too strangely, but it's one thing to do. It's a thing you can bring in. Your confirmation day, your kid's confirmation day, that's when the Holy Spirit, the hidden one, took a huge leap forward in your life. Pentecost Sunday, I do think it's one that we've got to elevate. And how do you elevate these things? Mothers have a key role here. What you cook makes a huge difference. The liturgical year and cooking are intimately related. Good cook, good food, good wine, good music, uh, good times. That's all part of the liturgical year. Because that's how we celebrate. Your wedding anniversary should be a key one in your, and again, it depends on how you celebrate it, is what the kids are going to pick up. Uh, but that sense of, and we'll get to this later actually, I, I don't think you can celebrate your wedding anniversary in a great way if you're not really doing something together that fits you, that's constantly bringing the sacrament of marriage to your own attention. It's the great grace we have to be parents comes from the sacrament of marriage. Do you pray together, even if a short hail Mary, or just Lord, glory be to the Father, around your marriage every day together? Or something, I know, we all should have some little way in which 
with our husband or with our spouse, our husband or our wife, we're together before God as husband and wife, asking His grace for that. And if we do that in some way, it can be big, it can be small, it doesn't matter, then we have the possibility of really celebrating our wedding day as part of the liturgical year for your kids. It's a key day for them. This is the day the man and woman who brought me into existence <coughs> came together. And then who made it possible for me to come into existence with the Blessed Trinity, to live the life of the Blessed Trinity. Because we, God uses parents actually to give the gift of faith to most of us. Some of us later on as adults come a different route. Most of us, most Catholics, come to the church through the parents. Now the father is going to have a huge impact on the formation of all the sons and daughters. Fathers are key to transmitting strength, what I call interior strength. You can see it here on the sexual. The father who's close, the daughter who's close to her father, close to her father, will have an easy time keeping the boys at bay. It is actually, she won't even have to do it. The guys will sense it. All the guys here, you all know what I mean. There, there are women you can sense who may be very attractive, but there's a strength about them. And to get closer, you get close with their permission. There's just something about them. They can be very attractive, and I, I mean, it's got nothing to do with being cheerful or anything. They have that sense of whether they will open the door to just a little bit more getting to know them. And I'm not talking about anything sexual. It's, it's just what well, it is sexual, but I mean, it's male, female. Uh, I don't mean sensual in any way. And that sort of thing can come magnificently. The gift from the Father. He doesn't have to work at it. Just be with his daughter. And that's stories. And how do, how do fathers get close to the kids? The golden years are the early years. And for men, there's a tension here. Because you're going to be young men when your kids are young. Or you can pass this on to your sons, or your grandsons, or your sons in laws, or whatever. They're the years where the profession is demanding. Where it says, I gotta work hard now, put the time in so that later, you know. But they're also the years where with ease you can just grab your kid's affection and you can sort of bond that affection with hoops of steel in the simplest way, where you can never capture that again later, no matter how much time you put in. With the young boy, two, three, and it doesn't care what it is. You can play tiddly wings, or you can play football, or ice hockey. You can be a jock, or you can be an intellectual. It doesn't matter. It's time, kid, playing in whatever way it comes naturally to you. With the son and with the daughter. Lots of physical affection sitting on the knee. I remember one uh, colleague of ours, another psychiatrist, said, you want to stop, you want to make sure your kid is never a homosexual? Very simple. Throw them up in the air and catch them when they're three, four months old. <laughs> and five and the physical horseplay is what you get. Because they follow the, both the shock and the joy. <laughs> you know that combination of fright and comfort in the arms of the father who loves them. That's getting into the whole thing. The affection, and particularly the affection of the father for both the sons and his daughters. And then the sexuality goes clearly different for, for boys and girls. But the boy ends up with a different strength. Talk about the strength the girl ends up with. The boy doesn't need to find a girl to bed. The boy who is not close to his father is going to look for the affection that wasn't given to him in that way which is most natural for him. When he becomes aware of the need and issues of the heart, which begins right in those early teen years, and if he hasn't been given it, he needs it. He's not a bad kid. He's been a most natural kid. To go and seek it where God has made it, where everything pulls him to, to find it. Inappropriate to be too early, but it's not his fault. So a huge amount of these guys who are out there who are doing all sorts of things that we wish they weren't doing, and we're in danger to our daughters. It's their fathers are the danger to our daughters 20 years ago. Hmm? And if we're not close to our kids, we're a danger to someone else's daughter, through our sons. So, 
be close. There's a sacrifice here for men. That's a sacrifice of time for kids, and it's always difficult. There was a, a woman who's just a good lady I was talking to, Mary Ham, and preparing for this, she's a great lady down in Washington, a tremendous amount of great work in this whole area. She was telling me the story, I'd heard it before, but she reminded me of uh, this young professional man, his father died a couple of years ago, and after his father died, he had access to his dad's diaries. And he went back just to see, because there was a particular day, there was a day when he was in his teens, that stood out, it was a very special day for him, had some huge impact, where he just had his dad for himself, they went off fishing. Nothing extraordinary, but it had some special effect on the heart of the son. And uh, it was one that probably was stayed with him until the day he died. But he went back to his dad's diary to see what his dad had written in that day. And the day before, or that day, his dad, who was a very busy executive, had in there about the struggle he had with himself to take the time off to give the day to his son the next day. And then in doing that, it was a great gift thereafter. It gave great strength to this man in all sorts of ways. So it's a real struggle, but out of that struggle can come tremendous good. Now, mothers have clearly a whole other way of protecting you. Very special way. And you'll have to have women to talk to you about this. For me, women are a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no expert on it. Except on, on what goes wrong. Now, motherhood clearly is under phenomenal assault. But it's crazy assault. Right now, I'm doing a whole study of European social policy and family policy. Europe, it is absolutely crazy. Europe is dying fast, and all the experts can see it. And it's writ large, and they won't say what needs to be done. It's restoring motherhood. Like fertility is dropping all over the place. What they're talking about actually is increasing childcare services for women so that they can go out to work. Now, I'm not against women going out to work, that's not the issue at all. But the issue is, is that motherhood has been pushed way, way to the side. And it's where the future of the world lies. So, one of the huge ways that you can help your daughters and help the world is talking about motherhood, writing up motherhood, getting bold about motherhood. And once women speak about it, nobody dares say anything. <laughs> <laughs> But we men can't do that. We do it with sounds patronizing or something like that. Right? It just won't work in this game. Uh, men can start talking about fatherhood, but not about motherhood. Um, now, by the way, I'm hoping I won't get a chance to cover everything. Questions may occur to you. Before we break, we will have, uh, I want to put you into just small little groups where you'll be beside each other. And what I'm going to, I'm flagging you in advance for this, because I want you to start thinking about it. If you had, we break up probably into five or six people. What I'd ask you to do is, between yourselves, come up with two, three questions that you wish would be answered. We probably will, I try and answer some of them today, but that doesn't matter, uh, because we'll get to it eventually. These questions can be key. What are the top two or three questions you wish were answered today? But if you had the chance, you would ask these, and if I was brilliant, I'd give a great answer. Yeah. Think about that, um, even I'm flagging you in advance a little bit, that it'll only take five minutes or ten minutes perhaps for you to come up with these, and then you can appoint one person to be described and the candidate, and later, towards the end, we can get to them, and even if we don't get to them today, we will get to them eventually. Now, before going on, they've deliberately, so far, stayed away from what I would really call the interior life and the supernatural life. Uh, because, but, because it doesn't matter. The person that I think has done one of the most helpful jobs I've ever come across in articulating what the spiritual life, the supernatural life, is all about, C.S. Lewis. And the book I would highly recommend is mere Christianity, uh, where by the end you see this magnificent adventure that God is calling us to. It 
It's a difficult one, but it's within the grasp of every person. And I want to mix two metaphors, actually. Well, they're not metaphors. The other person who did brilliant stuff, don't tell me, it's upstairs, and I get it during the break. I'll bring it down. I was reading it this morning. Another brilliant book for adults, well, for older kids, college age kids, and that would be good for them to start into it at some stage, called This Tremendous Lover by, who was a, a Cistercian abbot in Ireland and from Ireland. They were all great guys. And he starts the book off with the analogy of the crystal and how crystals are formed. And crystals are formed essentially in the solution. And he develops it. Now, to get back and read this to you. But really, if you take a crystal and the initial molecules, crystals are formed normally for what they call a mother liquid within a liquid. And it's, if the liquid is all over one thing, then the crystal gradually grows by bringing that liquid and solidifying around it and it grows out. And depending on the structure of the initial molecule, the rest of the crystal grows around it. And for instance, you can get a crystal and if you're going to return it into its original mother liquid, it'll continue to grow. So you can cause crystals to expand. And they keep exactly the same structure. All that, if, you, if the liquid is properly done and there's no disturbances and all that, you just get an exact replica of the whole thing going up. Now he develops the analogy, and then he says, that really this is what God is about. And the great initial crystal initial molecule is our Lord. And the sea, the mother load, is us. And he's trying to bring us all to him. Now I had gotten that analogy from him years back. And somehow or another I twisted it in my mind, but I think it's a good twist. There's two ways of looking at the crystal. The other is not with Christ as the original molecule, but with you as the original molecule. You're given your own God-given temperament, body, makeup, all the rest of it. <coughs> absolutely unique, as is that of all the And the way mixing C.S. Lewis and, and um, the author of this defense order, the way that you're meant to the way you will become the person you really could be. You know the thing, be all you can be? Well, the be all you can be is only attainable in your fullness through dying to yourself and coming alive to our Lord, letting Him gradually take over, yielding, doing that which He's asking of you, but which you want to hold back. That's what we're all afraid of. I know I am all the time. He's asking me a bit more. And the sooner I give it, the sooner I become the better person, the bigger me, the Pat Fagan that is potentially there. And of course, once I do that, then he beckons the next stage, and then the next, and then the next, and then the next. And the one we could look at and see it, well, there's two people come immediately behind that all the world knows. The Pope and Mother Teresa. Okay, just growing. Growing, growing, you, you, you. What more can be squeezed out? And he will do it, you know. But then look at him and look at Mother Teresa. Are they similar in any way? They are in the love of the Lord. But as two persons, chocolate cheese, huh? <laughs> <laughs> One was handsome and all the rest, and as someone else said, one of the ugliest women that God has ever come near. One of the most beautiful of them. Because you look at the trees, there's no. And yet there's tremendous beauty. So a very handsome man, and then this one who is totally different. And yet, the fullness of each other. And where did it come from? By dying to themselves and giving to him. Taking him in. So this is where I said if you take the molecule, the original molecule is that which God has given you, your uniqueness. But then the solution you're asked to take it as our Lord himself. Letting him in, and you grow, and you grow, and you grow. And that's how you reach your full potential. On this little book, this is a kid who died in his 20. I highly recommend it. It's great for yourself. It's great for me. 
but it'd be tremendous for your kids. Now, the one drawback is he was a bit of a brilliant kid. He had his downsides too. He really was. This kid was brilliant. But part of the brilliance, I'm going to give you the details on that. Okay. Actually, the only way you can get this is to ask me to get it. Give me your address and I'll mail it back. They're 15 bucks, $15, because it's between Kinko's it costs about $13 to reproduce this. The mother wrote it. He died in the year 2003. So he's not dead well. So there's, I think actually this kid can be kind of nice. And you'll see, I think after you read it. But this is a kid who quickly realized this. And just, in every way he could, he was giving himself to the Lord for a long time. Now, he probably had a unique gift. As his father said, you know, God gave us this great gift. And I think if we did anything, we just didn't get in the way. <laughs> we just didn't let it At age five, his mother recounts in here, when he was being put to bed one night, he said to her, she was chucking him in, he was five years old. And he said, No, I'm going to become a lawyer. <coughs> no, she said she didn't even think he knew the word. She hadn't been talking to him about monks, and he wasn't reading, and he wasn't going to a Catholic school or anything. So she doesn't know to this day where he picked up. She said, She said, Well, oh, what's a monk? He's a man who gives his life back to God. The life that God gave him, he gives it back to him. I want to be a monk. Five years of age, and literally somehow or another over the next while he did. So that by the time he was 20, he died of a massive brain tumor, which wasn't diagnosed until two days, three days before he went into a coma and died within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. um, he was one of the very few Catholics at Pomona University, which is over in California, near Malibu. It's, you know, where bright kids mm -hmm. of that sort of lifestyle that they do over there, all go. And he was loved all across campus. He was brilliant, he was one of the best dancers, he was on the soccer team, he was a great soccer player, this is the brilliant part of him. Um, he was, you know, all sorts of prizes, but he worked with an intensity that is phenomenal. Why? Not out of just one minute, just because that's the way he could give himself to our Lord, just more and more and more. It's just that given that dying to the self, you can see the whole thing going. So I highly recommend this both for yourself and for your kids, particularly your college kids. Yeah. Now, here's what I want to get to actually, on the, where all this is needed. On the supernatural life, we get to a supernatural life really by living the natural life very well. It's essentially living the natural life with our Lord. It's not by going after, like for most of us, we're not asked to be Cistercians to move off elsewhere. Though this book, that, that This Tremendous Lover, which I'll bring down, which is a great classic, it was written by a Cistercian for people who live in the world, well, for priests among us, but also he wrote it specifically to people in the world in mind. And there's really no difference. Because ultimately, what we're called to in the spiritual life, and what's going to be the tremendous difficult thing, well, it's easy in some ways. If we're with our Lord, actually, it's easy. To pass on to our kids, the most difficult thing is that the spiritual life with our Lord really demands dying to yourself. I used to remember, I, growing up in Ireland, the rest of it, was in my mind that there was this great struggle going on out there between Christ and the world and the devil, the world, the flesh, and the devil, you know? And it was only in the last couple of years I read about the great struggles between Christ and me. <laughs> okay, interior. This is the golden calf that I adore myself. That's the struggle for all of us, I think. It's not out there, it's right deep really deep in here that only we know. <clears throat> what is it? It's almost like you know, the Sesame de Mill, which in a way got a lot of that stuff wrong, um, even what the adoration of the calf was. But the image I have, remember from the teenager, there they were adorning that golden calf and all the rest. But that's exactly what I do with myself all the time. Now, here I am before you talking about introducing your kids and developing the uh, interior life. Your kids, a supernatural life. But two, three days ago, 
I gave real bad example to my kids in front of my wife over we had set it up that uh, we'd both be working really hard and it was like one of those days where you knew you needed a break. So I called Teresa and I said, I feel like a break today. Yeah. A little bit of Yeah. Okay. We got home. And then as the time went on and all the rest of it, we were looking at different things. It wasn't going to be possible. First of all, it was difficult to find a good movie. The good one was there. It was too early. Uh, the rest of the thing was too late, so we couldn't go and all the rest of it. So we said, okay, we'll get a video and watch it at home. And we had this all set up. I, a good guy that I was, and I washed the dishes. I got all this stuff out there. I'm a good husband. And we were all just planning to go. And then Teresa turned to me and said, Pat, do you mind if I go up to church to visit the Blessed Sacrament? I hit the roof. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt, I mean, to this day, <laughs> all the different things. Wait now, we had a date. And now you're going out with a different boyfriend. <laughs> and in front of the kids, you're asking me. <laughs> of course I want you. I can't say no, you can't go see your Lord. But, and, uh, you know, I knew even at the moment, all I'm doing is really wrong. But talk about it, you know, between Christ and here. Huh? <laughs> it goes so deep into us all the time and how we have. However, I took consolation actually. I was talking with Mary Ham, this lady who I think brilliant on a lot of this stuff, great work like actually give another talk. Um, about this talk. And I get to some of the points you said later because it's very true, but it, it, it it reminded me of something, and I'll come back, actually, I think it's going to be the big secret of how you introduce your kids to the supernatural life. It's going to be essentially in your marriage, and not by having a perfect marriage, but they see you struggling to make it better. I did that in front of two of the kids. I made sure to apologize to both of them almost immediately, and then yesterday came back to each one individually, and they just brushed it inside. And it was wrong, but probably what they're learning is that you have to struggle. And that you say sorry and that you make up and all the rest. And I don't know where it all stands in God's arm, but I do know that by saying you're sorry is much better for them. The other thing is that the interior life in the supernatural life is all about putting yourself gradually aside. And that's going to become most visible to them in your marriage. And one of the things actually that comes out of this, I'll say, is, you know, bad marriages can make perfect kids. Now, all of us would think, no, we need a perfect marriage to have good kids, right? That's now I take this with caution, and I, I'm this is hyperbole for the sake of getting a point across. But that it is the weakness in your marriage, and this is the one you're called to love most, is your spouse. And all your failings in that are very visible to your kids. Maybe not immediately, but they can sense it where it is. They know. <laughs> you can look back at your mom and dad now and all this, and you get the sense of where they have their struggles. But it is in the struggle that they will see you're going to Calvary. And if you die, they will see that. And that's where the supernatural life is probably going to be most visible to your kids. We can't inject it into them. We just hope that they will gradually take to it. But they will see it without us making it too visible. I made it visible there by my fault. It was so visible I had to go back and apologize. They will see it. And that is what it's all about. In each of us, I hope I don't do that again. I probably will do something similar many times. I have to apologize again and again. Maybe eventually, with confession and Holy Communion and prayer and sacrifice by my kids, that that gets better, I may get a bit better. <laughs> but what I hopefully do again is the idea of the struggle and that we're actually doing it for our Lord and that we're trying to die to ourselves. Now, I'm going to break down. I want to pick up where we left off which was the whole point of all this. And I think a, a huge, if there was only one, if the, well, there are two points I'd like you to go away with. One is that the supernatural life is not in the behaviors. 
Our Lord was emphatic about this. It is what is in the heart. Now the behaviors come from that, but behaviors without the heart, he is absolutely not interested in. He called it whitewashed sepulchers. And part of the, and it's not just the, I don't, not the hypocrisy part. We can really set our kids up for huge difficulties for a long time. Essentially set them into the Manichaean sort of split. Let me tell you, the first time I heard this, this man was not canonized. He is now. It had a huge impact on me. He said, if your kid, teenage kid, doesn't want to go to Mass on Sunday, don't force him. This man is now canonized. That's St. Jose Maria Escriva. That to love God, you have to do it freely. And if you push your kid, and you don't form him in the freedom, you're deforming and misforming and misshaping him. And he may comply, and he will comply if he's a good kid and he loves you. But you're not forming his heart. Now this is... I'm, Get me right, this is not for young kids. You know, young kid, a little spank I don't think is any harm. I'm not that much of a psychologist. Um, and you, obedience and all the rest is one of the key virtues early. But later on, by the time they're getting close to leaving home, they should know that you really respect their freedom. Even if it's going to hurt you to see what they're going to do. And they have to essentially have that because if they don't now out of love and affection and all the other stuff but they must approach our Lord freely and at some stage they've got to come to the realization it's now up to them it's not up to you anymore and that's what the whole transition from teenage into adulthood is taking on the responsibility essentially for their own salvation like we all know our spouse might make it to heaven and we might not Hmm? I fear for that. I know where Teresa's going. I'm not too sure. <laughs> you know, we are responsible for our own salvation and the impact we're going to have. And it really comes like this thing of dying to self, which is really at the heart of what our Lord is about, can only be done in the secrecy of our heart. And the struggles, which can be gigantic for us, could, might have no external manifestation, whatever. Okay? But what goes on in the heart is where our Lord really comes in or we throw him out. Uh, and that's what it's all about. So that's one of the... The second thing I'd like you to go away with is that actually it's in the struggles in your marriage to make your love better and better and better and all the rest. That's where your kids will probably learn the spiritual life more than anything else. Because that's where they see. That's where you'll model it. That's where you'll model the struggle. Um, another man who will probably be canonized, who was the successor of St. Jose Maria, uh, was here in New York about, oh, 15, 20 years ago. They get together. His cause for canonization has been introduced. Uh, Don Alvaro del Portillo. He was the second uh, president of Opus Dei. And a young couple just came up in this get together. It was introduced to him. They'd just been married the day before. So he called them up. And I forget what their name was. Let's say Jim and Joan. <laughs> and to drive the point home, he said, Jim, here's your Calvary, Joan. <laughs> <laughs> Joan, here's your way to heaven, your Calvary, Jim. <laughs> and we all know it. Any of us who have been married know that to make the marriage happier and happier, it is really a dying to self. Huh? And, and that's where I said, actually, the... The, the marriage with plenty of defects can be a marriage that produces the best kids if the parents are really struggling against the defects and the kids see that and gradually over time grace triumphs because huh? that's where the kid will see the struggle and the interior struggle it is not the external behaviors it's the huge difference between Calvinism and Catholicism, or the Protestant, is not the behavior, it's the interiority, okay? It's not the external behaviors. They are important if they're the fruit, and they're absolutely unimportant if it's not in there. Hmm? Okay. 
So how to get there, of course, is the tricky thing. And um, how you get there with your kids is by getting there yourself. And the rest will follow. And that's part of the divine mystery, um, how it's transmitted and all the rest. But we ourselves know it. You come across somebody who's, you, you've all, I'm sure, we all have. There are people who you know are probably close to our Lord. You just make up your own mind. You can sort of sense where they're coming from, one or others. And they're just great to be around. And after you've been with them for a while, you go back refreshed. Or to be in their presence is uplifting. Or you get great example from them. That's the communion of the saints. That's the Holy Spirit sort of doing it. And the same can happen in our own families. Huh? Now you say, <laughs> I say I, I'm sure, quite sure my sons are saying, being around dad is not going to refresh me at all. <laughs> but, <laughs> but eventually over time, maybe by the time, you know, the, the day before I die, it'll, it'll have gotten to that stage where there might be a bit of that. But within our families and in making them really places of joy, of hard work, of giving, not hard work so much, well, you want the kids to work hard, but where you're working harder even than they are. Uh, that's what forms them. The, I'm going to go into here some of the, what I call the human virtues, which is dealing on the natural level. Because if we don't form our kids on the natural level that's visible and where it's possible, I don't think there's any way we're going to form them on the supernatural level, which is less visible and where the cooperation of the Holy Spirit, well, the Holy Spirit is needed in all of it, but, but you can do a huge amount on the natural level. And in doing that, in your own supernatural way with our Lord, you'll be getting there. Um, yeah, I want to emphasize, <laughs> I want to read actually a little bit just by way of introduction, some of this stuff from uh, C.S. Lewis that had a huge impact on me uh, when I said one passage out of his, he was talking about the, the natural and the supernatural. Now, I'm, I'm going to start off and say the natural, I think, is very important, but at the same time, he's, he's making a very good point here, and he's talking about the natural level. He says, eggs and alcohol and a good night's sleep will be the real origins of what I flatter myself by regarding as my own highly personal and discriminating decision to make love to the girl opposite me in the railway carriage. Now, I know that's coming as a bit of a, a curveball to you, a, a bit of a transition, but here he's talking about What's natural? Propaganda will be the real origin of what I regard as my own personal political idea. I am not, in my natural state, nearly so much of a person as I like to believe I am. Most of what I call me can be very easily explained. As a matter of fact, social scientists are great at explaining. We can show this factor, your parents' income, your parents' education, your parents' DNA, and all the rest, and by the time social scientists finish with you, there's not much of you left. Huh? That's really what he's getting here. <laughs> I'm not in my natural state nearly so much of a person as I like to believe. Most of what I call me can be very easily explained. It is when I turn to Christ, when I give myself up to his personality, that I first begin to have a real personality of my own. This is coming back to that first major point. He continued, Christ will indeed give you a real personality, but you must not go to him for sake of that. As long as your own personality is what you are bothering about, you are not going to him at all. As a matter of fact, you're going to yourself. <laughs> if you go to Christ in order to have a good personality, you're seeking yourself. And we're probably going to do that a lot of the time as gradually catching ourselves. I think we keep adoring ourselves all the time, uh, and which is one of the great benefits of confession because there you go and if you seek to speak first in confession that you say that which is most difficult for you to say the thing you least want to say about yourself let it be the first thing you confess that's where you're really humiliating yourself hmm? your real the very first step is to try to forget about you this is cs lewis about the self altogether your real new self which is christ and also yours and yours just because it is his, will not come as long as you're looking for it. It will come when you are looking for him. <clears throat> the principle runs through all of life from top to bottom. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Use, lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death 
death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day, and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being, and you will find eternal life. Keep nothing back. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. That's why we need purgatory. That which is still in me that hasn't died has to be burned off before we can go in, in front of God. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him and with him everything else thrown in. And that's the huge thing. And this is why I suggest, by the way, if anybody, I talked about this and I got a question. Anybody who wants to get this, and I, an infinite thing is what it's called. It's about 50, no, it's 70 pages long. If you want it, write out your name uh, somewhere at the end. It'll be 15 bucks or write a check. Or if you want it later, I leave my name and address. You can mail it to me and I'll get these back to you. It's going to, we'd have to run off a, a run and that'll take a week or two. And then mailing back, it'll take another week or two. And then being Pat Fagan, you can multiply that at least by two. <laughs> so at the heart of all of this and somewhere along the line, starting with the kids, with the crash and that straw and putting it in the crash, is the dying to self sacrificing yourself in order to give to our Lord. But eventually, the big thing that every fiber in our being rebels against is that the cross is the way. Where we're always trying to find a way around the cross, and that's just the way we are. That's the way God made us. But he's also said, no, and that's why he came. And this is why I think is tremendous about Mel Gibson's passion. I think for me it's a great gift, and I think really it's, it really drives home. And there's that tremendous scene, if you've seen the movie, where you know, our Lord is up there on Calvary and the, the cross is there in front of him, and he's actually crawling towards the cross to go on to it. And yet at the same time, Peter and the apostles did the most natural thing when they first heard about the cross. They said, no way. Huh? And then our Lord was absolutely almost vicious back with them. Get behind me, Satan. The cross didn't come easy to our Lord either. Hmm? The temptation of Peter was strong, and our Lord just says, get behind me. Hmm? Every fiber in our being rebels against it, and yet, why? Because it's most natural. We all want to stay alive, and our Lord says, die. That struggle is going on. So if we're struggling with that, and it can come in any way, it can come in the simplest of ways, it can come in the biggest of ways, it will come in interior ways, external ways, small ways, big ways. There's that constant thing of dying to oneself is what it's all about. And if our kids really grasp that, it's not dying to ourselves, actually, it's coming alive to him. But in order to come alive to him, we've got to die to ourselves. If our kids leave our home at age 18 going off to college or age 20 or wherever they leave. With that knowledge, vision, we have given them everything that is necessary because we've given them baptism, we've given them the thing, we've given them the example, but if they go with that, they have the interior vision. And they can go forward. Now, some of the key virtues that I think um, one of the first ones, David Isaac's book, this one here, Character Building, I think is, one of, is probably the best book I've, I've come across in general. There are a lot of good things, a lot of other good books. But in terms of written for parents, enough of a study, you've got to chew on it, but it's not a high academic book. It's not written for academics. It's written for parents. Become an expert on this because there's virtues all the way through. For young parents, there are virtues which kids can begin with. You know what the simplest or the easiest virtue for a kid to start with, about age two, is order. I think it's God's gift to mothers. Kids, kids can begin to learn order at age two. It's the first virtue they can begin to acquire. And if they do, life is much easier for mothers. You know, <laughs> put your shoes neatly there, fold your thing up there, and you can work on it as, so that it becomes habitual. 
Um, and it's great. And it's the first virtue kids, kids are ready. Actually, there are certain virtues you're not ready even, you can't even begin to acquire them until you're much older. Have any of you have begun to struggle on acquiring prudence? I can't say I have, but you can't, even if you were primed, you'd probably be at least 16, 17 before you could even begin to understand what it might be. A younger kid can't be prudent. Friendship is not possible till you're into your teens. Real friendship is not possible. There are things which you can begin to acquire, and this book covers a lot. Uh, the second virtue, around the same time, and here it does take sometimes a little bit of strong handling on the part of the parent, depending on the kid. Obedience. Obedience is a key virtue, absolutely key. Because you as a parent, to form your child, your kid will have to be obedient. Now, in the beginning, when they're young, they have no intellect that's, you know, really developed. So it's really by repetition, and sometimes by a little bit of force, and once in a while. Some of the saints say, don't spank. But if you do only one, it would be the other way to put it. But sometimes a little physical thing helps a little, but never in anger. Actually, if you're angry, it is not the time ever to punish a kid. Because what you're doing is actually you're satisfying yourself. You're not forming the kid. If you're angry, you will misform. So don't do it. If you're going to punish, make sure that you have, as a matter of fact, you don't feel like doing it at that time. Hmm? It's always a good rule of thumb. Um, but obedience is a key thing, and gradually, you know, through the young years is when you can set it up why the kids should obey you. And the kids know this. And actually, if parents don't demand obedience of the kid, you're really sowing the seeds of doubt for the kid in your capacity as a guide. The guide has got to be confident. You would what not, not want to be going on a dangerous mountain or into a dangerous jungle or something with a guide who's a bit hesitant about where he's going. Huh? Well, essentially, our kids are in that same situation. And the confidence of a parent in leading does great things for the kid. And this is how they're going to learn, because at this stage, you're passing on a huge amount of wisdom just by and their sponges to take it up. So the virtue of obedience is one to be laid down in the very early years and well before four. I know a huge amount of parents who have got hell time with their kids because they were afraid to be strong and demand of the kids when they were two and three. And kids of different temperaments, by the way. Going back to this, the molecules you're given, hmm? by temperament, if you, it's good to get to know, I'd read a book on the temperaments, and there are many different ones from complex modern theories back to very simple, the four basic temperaments main thing about a temperament is, look, you're born with certain gifts or virtues, if not fully in place, much more in place. And you're also born without other virtues. And the temperaments are really what mix of virtues you got and you didn't get. That's what it comes down to. You're hardwired for some. You know the people who, for whom order is easy? OK. Well, order, that first of virtues, might come easy to some or others that struggle with for the rest of their life. But friendship is easy, or cheerfulness is easy. And then for others, they're melancholy. So we're, we're all born with gifts. The kid who's born headstrong is going to need different handling than a kid who's born compliant. But they both need obedience. Now, by the way, on the virtues, all virtues have two extremes. And the two extremes are vices. This is what we mean by the via media. You take orderly, let's take that. Too much order to this, obsessiveness, is a vice. It's not a virtue. When it becomes an obstacle for the enjoyment of others around you, it's no longer a virtue. Huh? And too little is also a vice. It's an obstacle to others around you. It's also an obstacle to your own life. So the, this is the, the and you can go that on almost every virtue except justice. You can't have too much justice. Huh? It's, the only, it's the only virtue which is just one end, huh? which is too little. You can't have too much. Uh, all the rest, essentially, is the via media. But being aware of your kid's temperament, of your own too, by the way, and of your spouse. How many of you know you could describe your spouse's temperament? I mean, describe it intellectually. Say, no, no, this is it. This is what comes easy. This is what comes difficult. Is it? Most of us can't, and most of us should be able to do it. And we should be able to describe our own. 
And this leads it back into one of the things that all the saints were very insistent on, and even the, if you want to call them the pagan <coughs> good men, leaders, know yourself and work on yourself. And then, you know, the saints, and probably St. Ignatius of Loyola, who's the first, I think, of the great modern psychologists, is the particular examination, the forming of a virtue very deliberately. But in order to do that, you need to know what your vices, your virtues, your strengths, your weaknesses, and all the rest are. And then get it. you should be an expert on forming virtue. But don't try to be an expert on forming your kid's virtue if you haven't become something of an expert, not necessarily on becoming virtuous, because then you'd be a saint, but on the struggle and knowing what it is huh? with yourself. There's a whole area of great development, starting with St. Ignatius, who I think is the great master of the particular examination of conscience, and then on many of the saints <laughs> since have developed it. You've got the external behavior. You, know, you want to acquire a virtue of orderliness with yourself, and how do you acquire a virtue? By repetition on the same thing. Huh? You make their, okay, I'm going to put my, it might be on your desk, you know, this is what I got to do, or probably something that your wife would appreciate more, the bedroom, your shoes, your socks, your laundry, and all the rest, those sort of things start there. But it's repetition, repetition, repetition on an external behavior. But there's another part to it, which is the interior. There's a huge amount of great development here. Do you know that all the time, we're almost always conducting a conversation with ourselves? Yeah, that's thinking, huh? The intellect is going all the time. How many of us are experts on our own interior conversation with ourselves? It's a whole area for you to develop. And essentially, what the saints eventually end up doing is the conversations with our Lord around the work that needs to be done, around what he's asking for. But we can begin to shape that conversation by working on ourselves in our interior life around, for instance, order in the bedroom. You can have a whole conversation with our Lord or maybe with your guardian angel around that. By the way, going back to the, to the young children, the guardian angel is another thing, like the infant and the crash. Youngsters are primed for the guardian angel. And the guardian angel can become a great companion to a child. I know a young man who's 20, who has had a great devotion to his guardian angel from early on. And he's describing to me, he said, you know, I'm pretty certain my guardian angel hits me in the elbow. <laughs> Because he said, there have been quite a few times where I, I'm about to do something wrong, and something always happens here. I bump into something, and it's sharp. <laughs> He's developed a great friendship with his guardian angel. He was telling me of a, a visit he had uh, to one of the great cathedrals in Europe, and he wanted to know his guardian angel's name. This is one of the things. Yes, it is. I've been... And he's gradually figured out his guardian angel's name is Chart, or that's what he's going to call it, because he, went, he was visiting the cathedral of Chart, and he went in there and he said to his guardian, look, I'd like to know your name, and I'm going to go in and pray about it. And he was going up the center aisle, and I don't know what it was, the way he described it, I forget. It was something like there was something on the aisle, and he stumbled. And then he went on up to the Blessed Sacrament, and he prayed there, and then coming back, he noticed this place where he had stumbled. And then he looked, he stopped, and then he just looked up. And here was this great statue of a great angel, majestic great angel, right in front of that spot. And he said, ah, oh, this is a hint, right? He said, you're telling me something. So he just named him Chart. This is an angel he'd been talking to for years, and now he's got, okay, there's a man who has a lively interior life, huh? And that can start. Any of your kids can get that if you lead them to it. Huh? Almost. Well, some kids will take to it more than others, but they'll all love it. And this is what I mean by if you have stories of books or instances in books, get them to me. I'll give the, the email at the end so that we, I can give them back to everyone so that we all have these stories, huh? this expertise that's in this room. Uh, I don't have it all. You have a huge amount of it. We can feed it back. Generosity, key virtue, clearly for the Christian. K 
kids can learn to be generous and with priming, particularly, and where do they learn it? With their brothers and their sisters in the home or with their friends. And you, you coach them, say, would you think of doing this? Maybe you could do this. You give them examples. And of course, then, you praise them for doing it. When they're young, you don't praise adults for their virtue. Not, well, you praise your wife for her virtue. You praise your husband for her. We'll get into that later. Uh, but with young kids, you do, because they have to know they'll bask in your enjoyment of their goodness. They can't see God, but they can see you. And this is where the father is particular. Well, if we're parents who are concerned about the virtue and the interior life of our kids, we'd probably nag a bit, or that's a human tendency that's likely. It is good that it's balanced <laughs> with thanks and praise for the good that you see. The great, um, th this works in all sorts of things. So it was the One Minute Manager by, uh, what's his name? You know the book I'm talking about, the one minute, the bestseller. Well, it, it, even at the workplace, it says, catch them doing the right thing. Huh? Letting them know, that's great. Catch your kids doing the right thing. Now another virtue which can be started early, needs to be started early, actually, is modesty. In girls particularly, but in boys too. And the whole thing here, this is where you can set up the Manichaean split, which is going to keep Rick and his cohorts in business forever, <laughs> or you can set the kid on the right thing, on the right line. Your daughters have to know and get the sense that their bodies are beautiful, that they are beautiful, <coughs> and that our bodies are, is the way God has made us. It's a great thing that God has given us that he didn't give to the angels, and it's a great thing. Because the angels can't do something that we can. We can bring new beings into existence, and the angels cannot. And God is always obedient to us when this dawned on me, it was, it was mind-blowing. In the sexual act, when the woman and the man are potent, God always obeys. On that, which is one of his greatest attributes, which is bringing new beings into existence. And the Lord of all creation obeys us always. It's mind-blowing. Absolutely mind-blowing when you think of it. And your sons and your daughters have got to get the grasp of the magnificence of their bodies when they're young. And, that, and the girls, that they are beautiful. And that they have this. And in your own ways, at your own pace, you can get this across. But that this body is reserved for the girl, for one man, who's in existence, and you don't know who he is yet, and she doesn't know who, and the boy, that his body is reserved for one woman, and he doesn't know who she is yet, though she may be born. Huh? She may already be there. And that that's then reserved for them. So that the girl begins to dress modestly, the, the brothers respect the modesty of the sisters, the sisters of the brothers, but it's always in a good thing. There is nothing evil about this. There is something sacred about it. Great, beautiful for one person to be preserved. No Manichaean split here at all. It is to be enjoyed. One of the things, by the way, flipping ahead to the college level, the thing I told about who has the best sex and all the rest, how many kids out there know that? Many kids up on campus here, Friday night, last night, know that? And yet they're all seeking it. Huh? We've got to, our kids better know that, huh? And we better be free enough to be able to tell our kids that. And if we can't, we've got a lot of growing up to do, huh? And most of us have a lot of growing up to do there because the Manichaean struggle is deep within human nature since the fall, huh? We've got to struggle there. And we help each other. But to transmit that to our kids is going to be key. Because within that is the whole thing of friendship, of loyalty, of beauty, of commitment, of marriage, with God, for the future, with new beings. 
the whole of existence is right in the little girl in the bathtub. Great time to begin to prime her. The mother particularly, with the boy and the girl, huh? when they're very young. Bathing is the most natural time to begin this conversation. If you're ready for it. You'll know if you're ready for it, if you can do it. And if you're not, get ready very quick, because that time is going to pass very quickly. So <laughs> get, together, get together with friends or get together with Rick. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Take whatever steps you have to, to be able to introduce that talk well. And then, and then by the time actually the boys are coming into the puberty stage, let them realize and drive home to them and have the conversations, the father particularly here with the boys, the mother with the girls, that every girl is some young teenage boy's sister. And if the boy has a sister, that he wants every other boy around to treat her the way he wants her treated. So he better treat and even think about every other girl the same way. Huh? That respect, this honoring of the sacred vessels of the bodies that we have, of who we are. Huh? We've got to transmit that to the boys and make sure. Now, this is going to lead in, immediately leads into a whole thing. The digital revolution is fantastic. Computers and all this sort of stuff. What's happening, actually, there's a huge transition happening in the modes of education. And essentially, we're, if you go back to, let's go back a century ago, read American history, how articulate, how well the ordinary soldier in the Civil War could write. You know, those letters home from guys who had just gotten essentially a grade school education, magnificent. They read, they knew their Bible inside out, but they were articulate and they were literary. Today, that's not the case. Part of the huge reason is the whole visual image. TV, movies, all the rest, we all love it. I love a good, I was telling you what provoked my fall two nights ago, so I was looking forward to it, okay? Um, the image, the image is extraordinarily powerful. It's a whole area that I think psychology and psychiatry and all the rest have not yet developed well enough. We have, we're very aware, and in the whole Western tradition, we're very aware of the intellect and the will and the need to form the intellect but the imagination is hugely powerful as an assist or as a detractor to both the intellect and the will, the capacity for images. In my book, The Single Best Therapist Ever, outside of Rick Fitzgibbon, <laughs> was Milton Erickson. He was a guy who essentially built it all on really studying hypnosis and what was going on, and eventually it really leads back to the imagination. And by the end of a long, long career, he had the capacity where it all led to was to tell a story that was tailor-made for the individual, the individual's psyche, which he could sort of figure out the structure of it and all the rest of it, whatever the problem was. And he could make up a parable or a story out of whole cloth just for that person that had the capacity to get underneath all their defenses, harness their imagination, and make things easy for them to get over their block and get on ahead. Now, our kids' imaginations are being formed by SOBs in Hollywood and in Manhattan and all the rest who have absolutely no interest in getting our kids into heaven and only want to make a fast buck. And how do you make a fast buck? You make it by enslaving. And if you enslave people in such a way that they'll pay you for being enslaved, not alive, you can make money out the gazoo forever. And it's a formula that these guys know, and the whole world knows. And I could become a millionaire, a billionaire, if I decided to go that route and set my mind to it. Now the sexual and the image and all the rest is very addictive. It promises everything and delivers nothing. Huh? The fantasy of this. Our boys and the girls and the whole area of like, I grew up in Dublin in the mid-50s through the mid-60s was my teen years. Censorship was there. Now, I wasn't exposed to this. I don't know what I'd be like growing up here today <laughs> with all this stuff all around. So our boys have a huge hard time. All the more reason, actually, for us to be very dedicated to their guardian angels and praying for them, but that they, too, all the rest. So we've really got to form our boys and our girls on this very different route. And essentially, yeah, this stuff 
has a false attraction. It's very attractive. I tell you, when I go to a hotel, I travel a lot. I've got to, going in and booking in, I say, plan in the 99. I don't want that temptation in front of me. You know what I'm talking about? On the adult video. Everywhere has it. Marry at the so-called great pro-family Mormon group, making billions on pornography. Why? Because it's very easy. You've got to let our boys know this. It's very simple. It's very easy. But it's pure illusion. And where's the great... Last year, to give a talk, and I had a whole lot of slides and all the rest, priming good kids who were going to be counselors in a summer camp. It was in Pennsylvania. Uh, the good schools. And I was going through the whole stuff. And I was showing them all this stuff on sexuality and all the rest. and A lot more than that. But essentially, the picture of America, some of the stuff you had here, some of the rest. And I got into this thing of the survey, Sex in America survey, of who has the best sex. And I said, no. Boys, I said, we're getting into a delicate area here, but you guys have got to get to understand this. Most of you have very, all of you, not most, I promise, all of you are very good parents. They've sent you to schools, they're bringing you to church, they want you to pray, they want you to do all this. Guess who has the best sex, guys? <laughs> and they saw where I was going, and they said, no! <laughs> I said, yes! <laughs> It's not Hollywood, it's not Tom Cruise, it's not Julia Roberts, etc., etc. It's men and women like your parents. And they've got to get to understand that. How we transmit it, my way of doing it is probably not the best, but <laughs> at least it's provocative. Huh? <laughs> but we, you have to get that across in the in the way that's appropriate for you with your sons and your daughters. Projects for young kids or for teenagers or anything. And by the way, what I'm saying here for fathers holds for grandfathers. Grandfathers have a special position. I see a number of men here who are older, and I hope I'll be a grandfather soon. And John is all, John has already a grandfather. But grandfathers can do everything that fathers can, still more. They have a very, as you, we all know it. Grandparents have a special place in the heart of a kid. They're already, <laughs> kids are primed, grandparents are primed. The fast route in there with the affection and all the rest then that comes with that. Grandfathers can do and actually can make up for their son's shortcomings, for their own shortcomings that they visited on their sons. They can make up for it by giving it to their grandsons. Huh? The same holds for the grandmother. Um, projects are great. And daring projects. Our kids have got to learn to be daring. This whole world out here is going into massive crisis. Europe is dying. The US could. Probably is a great struggle going on. There's all sorts of, it's a great time to be alive. But it's only going to be great for those who have big dreams, are audacious about it, and go to it. So we take on projects with a kid and we push them. <coughs> But it's not pushing them hard. We push them by running a little bit ahead and with them and all the rest. And taking on daring things. I don't care what it is. It could be building a table. It could be becoming a soccer player. It could be whatever way the kid's temperament is inclined to go, the gifts that God has given him, go with him and help him run faster and enjoy it. Not the, you know, the grinding sort of stuff. It's the enjoying sort of stuff. Huh? It's fun. But I'm going to push myself that bit more. I can do 10 push-ups. Okay, well, I'm going for 15. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's tough, it's tough. But now I've got 15. Now we could, whatever. Projects, in whatever way they come for you and for the kid. It's great to have one or two going all the time. It's very good for yourself to have projects where you're pushing yourself ahead. Life is full of projects till the day we die. And by the way, it's a good way to live long, is to have good projects. Huh? <laughs> Oh, the other thing that can be learned very early on is sincerity. Young kids can be sincere. And they'll never become sincere if you don't trust them. Because if you don't trust them, you're given the message, I don't believe you. And if you don't believe them, they're not going to be sincere. Why should they be? If a kid lies, accept his lie as the truth. 
Let him learn sincerity from you, that you expect nothing but the truth. And no matter what they tell you is the truth. That's a hard one to take, a hard one to chew when it happens, but do it. It's the best way for them to learn sincerity, that you would never expect anything but the truth from your kid, which means you never show disappointment at what they say. Because if they say and they confess what is wrong, you don't want to show disappointment, you thank them for being so truthful. And if they tell a lie, you take it as the truth and you don't show disappointment that it's not the truth. It's very hard to do, but it is. Get behind what I'm saying. It's not the behavior, it's the heart that's behind it. That you expect nothing but absolute sincerity from your kids and they with each other. And probably the best way is not when it's something between you, but with each other, huh? That they always be sincere with each other. That's gonna be the easier way. Absolutely key. And you can see where that ties into confession. Now, kids can't learn friendship, but they can learn generosity when they're young. Companionship when they're young, to be good companions, seven, eight-year-old. Friendship doesn't come really until the teen years. And this is where I say, get into the Isaacs book, and I'll send, by the way, anybody who wants, I'll send out a list of all, and this is just a few, and not, Isaac's book is great in character building. One for uh, Cormac Burke, I don't know if you've come across it. Cormac Burke was one of the top priests in the Roman Rota for ages. He's one of the church's gifts on marriage and family. This is a book, Covenant and Happiness, Love and Commitment in Marriage. Now, it sounds like it's just for the couples, actually, but it gets right into family life and the forming of kids. It's one of the great books. Um, I'll send out a list of all these to anybody who gives me their email at the end, so have your email on the stuff, and then I'll get all that. And for any of the other stuff, I need your email, too. But that's something I will do, so you don't have to struggle about getting the list of books down. Okay, we're almost to finishing towards the main points I went to end up with. Um, the big thing is your marriage. We talked about, like if you say what, the, what is the talk really about, it's forming the supernatural life in your children and the homework I'm essentially suggesting to you has got nothing to do with the kids. Actually, the best therapy is always indirect. Um, for some reason, the only thing that just flashed into my mind, it was, yeah, well, you could call it therapy. It was definitely somebody, a lady who knew where she wanted to go. You remember my big, fat Greek wedding? You remember where the wife decides she's going to get the husband to do something? And she and her friend figure it out. And then you got that great scene where the two women are there and the husband is in front, and he thinks he's leading the whole way. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he's the head of the family, but I'm the neck, huh? <laughs> The indirect way, the indirect way to the heart and soul of your kid is through your spouse. That's where you will die most. Go back to Don Alvaro del Portillo. Jim, here's your Calvary. Jane, here's your Calvary. For every one of us, that's the Calvary that's most important. What's the great commandment? The great commandment. Well, the great two. Love God and love your neighbor. It's the one we're going to be judging on. Who's our closest neighbor? It's our spouse. And if we take care of that one most, at least we struggle. At least we've done that one. We may not have fed all the poor. We may not have become as generous as Mother Teresa. But that one our Lord does expect of us. That one he is going to ask us on. <coughs> But also, it's in that one that the kids see, and, and they'll see it and feel it and experience it. Huh? And it doesn't matter, actually. It doesn't matter what stage things are at in the marriage, whether it was broken and just the healing of it. How many, how many people do we know? Well, we know many people who have divorced. We occasionally hear of people who divorce and then get back together and then rebuild their marriage. I had a friend who died two years ago, Bill Pierce, a public guy at his 
divorce was well known, so I'm not divulging anything personal here. Bill was one of the great men in adoption, has done huge amounts for I, Rick. He opened up China for adoption. Quiet work with the Chinese embassy for about 10 years, nobody knowing about it, down in Washington, and eventually opened up China. Rick had been a bit of a liberal and got caught up in all the stuff and left his wife back in the 70s or 80s. Sometime after that, found our Lord again. And gradually his prayer brought him back. I have got to heal this again. And I was at this ceremony where it wasn't a remarriage, because they were married, always married, but where there was a sort of a public affirmation of their wedding again. And their teenage kids were there. Now you imagine how those kids were. The great lesson that they have taken from a man who out of love of God rehealed a very broken marriage and all sorts of bad things. And the kids don't worry about the bad things. What's going to live with them forever? Yeah, the other may have damaged, but we're all damaged, huh? <laughs> we're all damaged. What really they take from him is that healing. In our marriages, no matter what stage they're at, whether they're perfect and need greater perfection, of course, the great perfection up here is going to be even more difficult struggle. Huh? But at any stage we're at, it's all a difficult struggle. That's where they will learn most that you love our Lord. Practical things on that? There's a guy, Doug Weiss, who's written a book. I don't recommend because there's one flaw that I recommend 95% of it, but he's got one or two things that are not in accordance with what the church teaches. But he's got some very practical advice. <clears throat> and one of the things is for men particularly, and the women here, well, become expert at expressing your feelings constructively in a way that's helpful. Men, North American men, were primed the very opposite way. Our wives die of thirst for us not expressing our feelings. So we've got to become better at that. It will be, it, it, by the way, it's something that men love. You become better at that, you're going to have a fantastic time in bed with your wife. <laughs> the two things are linked. The other thing I think that he suggests, and I think it's good, within all the parameters, depending on the couple, that at least you pray together once a day, and I would say at least about your marriage. And it can be something very short, but to be together in front of our Lord, at least on that. You know, some people are, I'm not one of them, was it, you know, the people who like expressing, praying out loud together and holding hands and all the rest at, at Mass. I'm the guy who, well, <laughs> you know, it doesn't come to me. But there are other people who do that very well. And all the rest. It doesn't matter what spectrum you are on that, but that praying together before God a day, even a very short prayer, would be very, very good. Expressing the feelings, and then the third thing he said, every day, or at least once a week where you'd set aside, I would say every day, but at least once a week, where you set a time aside and you deliberately praise each other for something the other has done. And the only thing the other person says is thank you. Just praise about something done. The nurturing, the nurturing. We know how our kids thrive on praise. Hands up anybody here who doesn't like to be praised. <laughs> okay, well, look, we all, we all love it. And we all seek it, unless we're saints. But even the saints would love it too. Huh? Mm -hmm. Our Lord loves it. So there's no harm in us having it. To praise each other. It's essentially nurturing each other. So a little prayer together, lots of praise, and feelings. Three areas where we all need to work on, and if we do, it'll be magnificent for our kids. I want to go very quickly through.